It is now my tremendous pleasure that I introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Roseanne Chick Canfora. Dr. Canfora has remained one of the most recognizable contributors of education and commemoration events since May 4, 1970, when she survived the Kent State shootings by taking cover behind a parked car. She is the sister of wounded student Alan Canfora, friend to other slain students, and one of the 24 students indicted by the Ohio Grand Jury when it unsuccessfully attempted to place the blame for the Kent State killings on students. Dr. Camphora left Kent after the shootings in 1970, but returned to KSU to complete her bachelor's degree in education, a master's degree in journalism, and a PhD in educational administration. A member of the May 4 Advisory Committee, she speaks frequently at campus events and is committed to raising awareness of May 4 as a pivotal moment in American history. Beyond her activism around May 4th issues at Kent State, Chick taught high school English and journalism for more than 25 years and is today the Chief Communications Officer for the Cleveland Metropolitan School District and an adjunct professor in the School of Journalism at Kent State. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Roseanne Chick Canfora. Good morning, freshmen. Wow, that's tough to hear again, isn't it? You worked so hard in high school to move from your freshman year to your senior year, only to find yourself at the beginning all over again. But that's OK. I know how excited you are that you're finally here at college, and you should be. I began my college journey 50 years ago. And I have to tell you, there was not one thing in my life or in my education up to that point that could fully prepare me for what college was or could be for me. And if I do nothing else today, I will share with you the wisdom that I wish someone had shared with me on my first day at Kent State, because some truths are timeless. When it comes to reflecting on what college is, I speak with some authority. The authority of someone who's been a student or a teacher at Kent State for two-thirds of my life but also as someone who has unwittingly for the past 50 years lived and relived my Kent State undergraduate experience. I have to admit that I was touched profoundly when President Todd Diakon invited me to step out of Kent State's history and onto this stage at this very important moment in your life, your entry as a Kent State University student. Granted, your college experience will be vastly different from mine in many ways. My tuition was $197 a quarter, and my room and board in Lake Hall, just steps away from this auditorium, was about $450 a year. I could work a minimum wage job over the summer and pay for my education myself. Our dorms were single gender, and male visitors were only allowed on the dorm floor on Sunday afternoons. When they visited, we had to yell loudly, man in the hall, to warn of their approach. We were required to keep our room doors open throughout the visit, and regardless of where they were sitting in our dorm rooms, our guests had to keep one foot on the floor. We challenged one rule in Lake Hall, the one that required women to wear skirts or dresses to dinner in our dorm cafeteria. We simply showed up one day in the jeans we wore to class and refused to get out of the food line. It was the first of many moments in college when I realized I had a voice and I could make a difference if I used it. We arrived on campus having known just about everyone in our graduating class in high school, 
and moved into a campus community where we knew no one. We made friends by knocking on doors, introducing ourselves, and asking, hey, where are you from? When I brought my two sons to Kent State as freshmen, years later, college was already very different for them in the dawn of a new century. In the age of social media, they'd already connected with their roommates and dorm residents online over the summer. As I walked them to their dorm rooms at Lake Hall and Stouffer Hall, my boys were already high-fiving friends they'd met before they even arrived at Kent State. And there were men and women in the hall. I envied them, as I envy you now, arriving at college where, I promise you, the most challenging, inspiring, surprising, memorable, and defining years of your life await you this year and the years ahead. Don't miss it. If you think you know just about everything you need to know about yourself, about your life and the world you're about to enter, think again. I taught high school English and journalism for 28 years, and the juniors and seniors that I helped prepare for college admission often expressed frustration that they were asked to declare a major before they got to college. My response to them was always simple. Don't be too quick to decide. At 18, how could you possibly know what you want to do with the next 30 or 40 years of your life? Chances are you'll change your mind several times, and that's okay. Until college, you haven't even begun to explore the full range of possibilities and the new ones that are emerging every year in a global society. It is here in college that you're in the best position to figure it out and get it right. Even if you think you have an inkling of who you are or what you want to be, now is the time, and this is the place, to open, to be open to the magnificent realization that if you want something and you're willing to work for it, you can do anything, anything. It was my freshman year when Alan Chesler, the instructor of my first college English class, challenged us to answer a simple question. If you could do anything, no holds barred, money, no object, what would you do? He gave us a moment to think, but I already had an economic answer to the question of what I would do with one wish. I'd wish for several wishes, of course, and he called on me first. My answer was practical and predictable for a sheltered 18-year-old girl from Barberton, Ohio, where most of our mothers were stay-at-home moms, and many of them, like my mom, didn't even drive a car. If I could do anything, I would graduate with honors, get a job I love, marry a wonderful man, and raise my three healthy children in a beautiful house on the beach. Posing the same question to a freshman sitting next to me, Mr. Chesler asked, what would you do if you could do anything? And the young woman said, I'd stop someone from committing suicide. I was like, that is so cool. I would do that. Why, did, why didn't I think of that? For a gut-wrenching moment, my practical, predictable response seemed so very small in comparison, and in its weight, it seemed so narrow-minded. I felt so selfish. In my classroom that day, there were other students like me that wished for material things, like a Corvette Stingray, while others wished for a cure for cancer or an end to the war in Vietnam. My short walk from Satterfield Hall to my dorm room at Lake Hall that day gave me plenty of time to think about how my small scope, um, or how small my scope was when I arrived here. It gave me a chance to think about how limited my vision of the world was and my place in it. More than anything that I would ever learn in that English class or in any class my freshman year, I recognized early in my college experience how much I would learn from others simply by being present by listening and looking past my limited experience, my own narrow beliefs, and my embryonic perspective. Here at Kent State, you will learn, as I did, more about yourself and your place in the world than any subject matter you explore or any major you declare. You'll learn about the world you're preparing to enter, mostly by meeting people whose background, experiences, and beliefs are different from anything you've ever known. And you'll learn best by getting from your college experience all that it truly has to offer you. So don't be too quick to run off to 
to work after class, head downtown for a night of partying, because there's no one to remind you that you have homework to do or you have school in the morning. In fact, don't be too quick to get off campus. Take time to explore this beautiful place and discover what the university you've chosen has to offer you. Check out the organizations you can join and expand your horizons through, the programs and activities in which you can discover a skill you never tried to develop or a talent you never dreamed of tapping into before, the opportunities you have to serve your college community or take up a cause that will make a difference in the world are boundless here. Register to vote and make a thoughtful choice next year about who makes decisions about your life and your future. When I came to Kent State, we didn't have the right to vote, and we fought for your right to do so. I majored in English and minored in speech because those were the courses and programs I excelled in most in high school. I tried out for cheerleader and flasherette because I'd been a cheerleader and a majorette, and pretty much I knew just what to do. As a freshman, I became social chairman of my dorm and a little sister of Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity because I was just used to joining all the clubs in high school. In essence, I came to college simply to be more of what I already was. But my campus experience quickly challenged me to focus instead on what I might become if I just paused once in a while to learn something new or listen to my heart. Kent State is an incredible place with a remarkable history of student activism that I am so proud to be part of and I hope that you will learn everything about this year in the 50th anniversary of its most historic moment. The people I met and the opportunities I had here 50 years ago and in the decades since have continued to expand my scope, introduce ideas and interests I never dreamed I'd discover and develop my talents and potential in ways I never dreamed possible when I sat where you are. Like my experience in Mr. Chesler's freshman English class, you will chance on conversations in the hub or walk past a gathering where someone's message resonates with you, challenges or motivates you right here on your campus. You'll notice people engaging in activities you never thought of doing, but if it looks like something you'd like to try, do it. This is the time to do it. We never had a drama club in my high school, but I always wanted one. So I tried out for Romeo and Juliet my freshman year, and although I got a small part, I continued acting and directing in plays the rest of my life because I was drawn to one audition notice on a bulletin board I passed in the music and speech building my first year of college. On my way to my speech class where I met Sandy Scheuer, I always passed the telecommunications department where I would see students on the air on the campus radio station or at the news desk at the campus TV studio. I was always drawn to and fascinated by what they were doing, but I never opened that door. Years later, when as a teacher I fell in love with journalism, I regretted not exploring telecom as a major, and I wondered what might have happened had I just walked through that door when I was a freshman at Kent State. Orville Redenbacher is famous for saying, do one thing and do it well. Well, he did popcorn. And he did it well. But at Kent State, I learned a lesson that I pass on to my students and my children over the years. Do or at least try to do anything your heart tells you that you might love to do. And just do it the best you can. If nothing else, you won't find yourself, as so many people do, years or decades later, asking, what would have happened if I tried it? Where would I might be? Where might I be if I just walked through that door? At the age of 22, when I was still an undecided undergrad, I fell in love with the beautiful sounds of the harp when I heard its celestial strings in the background of an Elton John album. Intrigued, I signed up for a harp class at Kent State without even owning a harp. I practiced late at night on a harp stored in the stairwell at the Music and Speech Building after serving tables at the Brown Derby restaurant on Main Street. Each night after struggling through my exercises, I'd walk up seven steps and look down at the harp to visualize myself mastering its 46 strings. Frustrated with my slow progress, I moved to New York to take lessons with a renowned harp teacher. And despite the opportunity to study with Pearl Shertock, I almost gave it up simply because I was embarrassed at the age of 22 to be on a stage in recitals with six-year-olds 
who were better than I was at playing the jolly peasant or twinkle, twinkle little star. It's too late, I thought. I should have done this when I was younger. I still didn't own a harp. But before I quit, at the age of 22, I went to hear a harpist in her teens who was performing at a library in Rye, New York, and she was really good. Afterward, I went up and asked, how long have you played? Four years, she said. And then I wondered, if I quit now, when I'm 26 years old, I will wonder how good I might have been. That was 43 years ago, and I've played the harp ever since. And I have a harp, actually four of them. I perform every weekend, I get paid for it, and I'm really good at it. I share this story because over the next four years, you can get really good at a lot of things if you put your mind to it. And I can't say enough how important it is for you to take time to discover your talents and allow the opportunities that abound on this campus to help you do it. My Italian father was a factory worker who told me in my junior year of high school that I shouldn't get my hopes up of going to college because it would be a waste. I would just get married and have babies anyway. But it was my father who actually made me want more than anything to go to college. I heard him every morning at 5.30 make his slow walk from his bedroom to the kitchen, where his conversations with my mother over coffee revealed how tired he was and how much he hated his job. I promised myself that day when my alarm goes off for the um, work in the morning, I, I want to love where I'm going. I want to love what I'm doing. And I've kept that promise to myself. It is here in college that you will discover what you love. And for some of you, who you love. Here you will learn to love the journey more than the destination. You see, the beauty of a liberal arts education is that you're expected to learn a little bit about everything in these first two years before you focus the last two years on learning a lot about something. It is here that you might begin as a hospitality management major only to land in an astronomy class because it was the only science elective that fit your schedule and discover by accident that you want nothing more than to look at stars for the rest of your life and get paid to do it. Never again will you be part of a community so vibrant, so diverse, so inspirational, and so filled with reminders every single day that anything you dream today is possible. I feel so privileged and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to kick off this wonderful chapter in your life. I am so filled with hope for all of you and for the future that awaits you. So work hard, make friends, take a blanket to Blanket Hill, say no when your gut tells you to, reach for something beyond your grasp, Walk through every door that interests you and call your mother a lot. Thank you.